Revelation chapter 3, if you would please. Revelation chapter 3. Good to be here this morning. Good to wake up. Good to have Jesus with you everywhere you go. Amen to that. Aren't you glad? When you think about it, aren't you glad you're saved? Glad you're saved. Glad you're born again. Glad you know Jesus. And you think about all the places that you could have been born in where they don't allow Jesus to be taught, preached. Think about all those places like that. And God allowed you to be born in a place where you could hear about Jesus, know about Jesus. Of course, I believe that according to Romans 1, um, that everybody knows, everybody inside their soul knows God. According to Romans 1, they do what? Without excuse. They are without an excuse, the Bible says. And um, I think that if some person anywhere in the world, no matter if they were secluded or if Christianity was never allowed to be taught, I believe that that person opened up their heart and said, God, whoever you are, I want to know you. I want to, I, I want to be with you forever. God would find a way to save that man or that woman's soul. I, I knew um, when I was in Bible college, there was a couple there, a man and a woman, they were several years older than, than the rest of us young students there. And I really admired them. I never talked to them much, but some of the people that had talked to them, they said, have you ever heard their testimony? And I said, no, I, I didn't, didn't even know they were Christians. And they said, oh, yeah. They were living in Iran during the days of the changeover, the revolution, when they... Uh, exiled the Shah of Iran when Iran was more of an open country to when the Ayatollah Khomeini took over and it became this extremist Muslim state. Well, these two young people were Christians and they had been taught Jesus Christ and they realized that as long as that was an, an Islamic state, they weren't going to last too long. And they literally escaped. Um, I know that they wandered through the desert. They got split up at one point and wasn't, but neither one of them was sure if the other one was going to make it or not. God found a way somehow of bringing them out of that country. They went for days without food and water and escaped out of Iran with their lives, uh, got permission to come into America, found one another again, reunited, and was going to, to our little Bible college there in Moore, Oklahoma, and I went, are you kidding me? And they said, no, that's, they almost, both of them almost died. But see, that's, that's God. That's the kind of God that he is. If, if, I don't care who you are, where you are. If you open up your heart to God in, the, in your soul, God will save you. God will find a way to teach you the gospel and God will save you. That's what I believe. Revelation chapter 3. Now, People like that who um, have had to endure that kind of hardship for their faith, not willing to give up their faith, willing rather to give up their own life, give up one another if necessary for the sake of Jesus Christ, People like that who have been tortured, people like that who have been, they had been imprisoned, people like that who escaped with their very lives, they've had their faith tested. I'm not saying that we haven't, 
But they have had their faith tested. Not their works. Their faith. And having had an opportunity to either give up that faith, live in a Muslim extremist state just to stay alive, well, the Bible says of those in the book of Revelation that they love not their lives even unto the death. That they cared not about their own selves and their own lives here on this earth. Willing rather to suffer affliction here on this earth and to gain the glory and the joy of heaven. What was it that was said about Moses? Moses, rather than choosing the uh, pleasures of sin for a season, chose to leave all of that. He was, what, second in power, third in power to Pharaoh himself? Had he remained that way, it's possible he could have become Pharaoh. And yet he walked away from all of that, choosing rather the affliction of wandering in the wilderness at, at the call of God because of his faith. In Revelation chapter 3, this is um, uh, the church of uh, Philadelphia. At verse 10, he says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. Now, I used to, back years ago, on Saturday night before I'd go to bed, I'd lay in bed and watch Dr. Jack Van Impey. And um, Jack Van Impey would always quote this verse and say that it referred to the seven-year tribulation and that God would keep us out of that. In other words, we would not have to endure any, any tribulation. I don't see that in this verse anymore. In fact, I don't really agree with the good Dr. Jack Van Empey. Is he still alive? He's died? Did his hair die too? And he always had, he had a lot of hair. Um, but anyway, I, I, I just don't agree with a lot of the things that at one time I'd listen to him and say, yeah, that's how it's going to be. But let's look at it. I will also keep thee from the... At, at, he says, because thou hast kept what? The word. The word of my patience. You're holding it in your hand. You have the word of God's patience right there in your hand. You're holding on to, we're living our lives by a book. We're not following a religion as such, even though this is religion. We're not following uh, a, de a particular denomination. We're, not we're certainly not following a man. Don't follow me, because I don't know where I'm going either. Um, we're following the book. We're living by the book. We are people of the book. And uh, if you are truly people of that book, nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can talk you out of it. Nobody can separate you from it. Nobody can do that. And he says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, and you've held on to what the Bible says, and you're not going to deny it, and you're not going to walk away from it, you're not going to choose something else besides it. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, all the world, to try them. And I want you to think of that word, try. To try something, to put it on trial, to test something. Um, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast. That means hold it 
and fasten it to yourself, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. In other words, you let go of your faith, you let go of the, the word of patience, you let go of this book, you lose that crown. Now, uh, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, 1 Peter is probably, if, if you are ever in a situation where you find yourself or your faith being tested, this is where I recommend you go. If you ever find yourself, and I've been there before, times when I ask the question, God, is this book right? You told me it was. But God, I'm having a problem right now. God, I'm having an issue right now. God, I'm having some serious... I mean, the devil's really attacking me. God, is this book right? Can I trust it? God, of course, says, you know you can. Open it up and read it. But if you ever find yourself in a place where doubt comes in, a lack of faith comes in, you run out of patience, you've asked God for things, God hasn't done it. Remember what I said earlier this morning during the assembly. Uh, we can tell that we're entering into a new season. It's going to get hot today, like 95. But all this week, it was way down in the 80s. And you could sort of just feel a difference in the air. You could feel fall coming in. Before long, all these leaves are going to change. And it's going to take a little while, but we're going to start to see that, that change take place. That reminds us that God's changing the seasons. He did it last year, he did it the year before last, he'll do it next year. And a lot of times when it comes to um, how God works and what he does, how he answers our prayers and so on, a lot of times it has to do with seasons and times. God answers prayers according to certain times, according to certain seasons. That's just how he does it. Um, but Peter, 1 Peter is the book to go to. 1 Peter is about suffering. 1 Peter tells us that it's better to suffer for righteousness than it is to suffer because you've sinned. If you're suffered because you sinned, you're just getting a whipping from your father like you deserved, like you had it coming. Don't go whining to God and to the church and everybody else saying, oh, I'm just having it so bad and I don't understand why. Yeah, you do too. You do understand why. You know what you've been doing. You know the sin and the rebellion that's been in your heart. And you know that God's getting you for it. You just want everybody to feel sorry for you while it's happening. It's happening to you because you've had it coming. And what you're getting from God is a whole lot better than what you could get from God. Somebody say amen. Whole lot better. God has never been that mean to you. And so he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. Reserve. Think about the language he's using here. He's telling you about heaven. Everything in this world fades away. These leaves, these flowers that you planted, the fruit <clears throat> that's coming out. It's going to be apple picking season here before too long. And if it ain't there already, time to pick pears, time to pick strawberries or whatever. Time to start picking stuff out of your garden. Well, all those things are going to fade away into wintertime. In wintertime, there's going to be nothing. But in heaven... No more seasons, no more dry times, 
No more times when the sky is dark anymore. There's none of that. It's, it's an inheritance incorruptible. And it comes to us and is promised to us by a book that is incorruptible. Incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. Who is it that's holding on to your salvation? God is. God is keeping you. God is the one that's holding on to you. God is the one that is preserving you. God is the one that has taken what you have given to him, which is your soul, and he will keep that which you've committed unto him against that day. Even Job, Job, the first, more than likely, the first book of the Bible ever written, said that I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he will stand and I will see him. He knew that all the way back then and we should know it now here in the end of the world. We should definitely know it that that day is coming. Re reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith. Kept by the power of God through faith. Faith is always part of salvation. And I've had people, crazy people, um, hyper dispensationalists and I don't know where they come from but they're trying to tell me that faith is a work for salvation that I teach a work salvation because I teach that you must have faith for salvation am I wrong for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So They, they both always go together. Um, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. See that word? Season. Season. God does everything in seasons. There's a time to rejoice, a time to weep, a time to live, a time to die. What did Solomon say? All those times that we're given. There's times when we are going to be fruitful in our life for Jesus Christ. And just be honest, there's times when we're not fruitful for Jesus Christ. We're just sort of resting. There's a time to work, is there not? And a time to rest. I knew a man, in fact he came to this church about the last year or two of his life. The church that he went to was a good church. And he was one of these men that, I mean, he couldn't do enough for the Lord. He helped the pastor. He, did, he led the singing. He, uh, he was, uh, I think, a deacon in that church. And just anything that needed to be done, that man was involved in it somehow, some way. Not because he was a busybody and always had to have his way about everything. He's a very humble man. But he just loved the work of the Lord and did as much of it as he possibly could in this church that he went to. Well, the devil always comes, steps in and stirs up trouble, and there he stirred up trouble between this man's family and the pastor's family. Now, him and the pastor were still good friends, but because of the situation, 
they just realize that it's probably best that we go to a different church. And there wasn't, to my knowledge, a, a lot of animosity between the man and the pastor because he was, he was such a good man. So they started coming here. And he sat right around here. And I didn't know all this about him. I didn't know all this about him until after he died and I was going to preach his funeral. He sat in this church. He had loved this church. He enjoyed the, the singing. We still sang out the hymn books. He enjoyed that. He enjoyed the teaching, the preaching. And he just sat and just took it all in. Took every bit of it in. And the whole time that it was here, it, every now and then, if I'd go on vacation, he would volunteer to lead the singing. But when I came back, he would sit back in his pew and just, and he sat and took it all in. He died suddenly uh, of a bad heart. I mean, it just took everybody by surprise. He died within six months of his retirement is what happened. And I'm listening to the family. I'm at the family's house listening to the former pastor listen to the family, how they talked about him and what all he did at that other church. And I went, he didn't do that at our church. He didn't do anything like that at our church. All he did was sit here and listen and learn. He was blessed. He used to tell me all the time, Brother Mike, I sure appreciate your teaching. I love you, brother. I want to encourage you. Keep doing it. And he just sat and took it all in. See, there was a season for him to be fruitful. And at that church that he was at, he was a very fruitful man. But when he came here, it wasn't time anymore for him to be fruitful. It was time for him to just take in and rest. Those of you who know who I'm talking about, you know that's exactly what he did. Good man. And he used to sit there and just smile and listen and sometimes wipe tears out of his eyes. And he was just blessed being here. But that was a season in his life before he died. He had given everything he had to give. And when he came here, God said, you're here now to receive back what you've given out all your life. And I preached that at that man's funeral. I also preached because I knew that that man was what held that whole family together. Uh, and because of his love for the Lord. And I said, those of you in this family who are leaning on him for number one, being the, the band that holds the house together and being the band that holds you in church, you're going to have to learn now to do this on your own or this family will split up and won't none of you be in church. Whole family split up. They hate each other. He was the one that was binding them all together. And he was the one that they all followed when it came time for church. But when he died, over the course of years, everybody just fell out. There's a season for everything. A season for everything. Uh, so let's back up now. Verse 6 here. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Manifold means many different types of temptations. Sinful temptations, other types of temptations, other types of trials that take place in your life. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Ask yourself the question, which would I rather have? 
Would I rather have the gold and the silver and the money that say Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Donald Trump or any of these other people? Would I rather have that kind of money and live that kind of life? And believe it or not, there's a lot of people in this world who would gladly live that kind of life. I met them all at the casino a couple weekends ago. They're all hoping to strike it rich and get that one great big win in and then they would blow it all. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I believe 100% and can show you from this Bible that we are going to go through a fiery trial before we leave out of here. A fiery trial. I'm pretty sure I know what the fire is about. I know what it means. I know how I think God's going to do it. Uh, it's not the fire that destroys the entire universe. That comes at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ and the, and the great white throne judgment. But before that, there is a fiery trial that is coming. Um, think of the fiery darts that Satan hurls at us, that he throws at us. What are some of those darts? What do you think they are? Just give me a guess. Give me an idea of what you think some of them might be. Huh? Bad health. Bad health. Yeah. Love of, money. Love of money. Yeah. Loss of peace. Loss of peace. There you go. Huh? Yeah. What about... What about false doctrine see you need what do we stop those fiery darts with the shield of faith and he hurls fiery darts at us and the only way to stop them is a shield of faith in this book if we don't believe this book those fiery darts are going to penetrate right to our heart and they're going to change our mind. It's like I told you about the guy that I met and I felt so bad for him. He is the Texas UFO Network investigator. He investigates UFO events that take place all in the state of Texas. And uh, he said when he, when he got into that, he was very skeptical about UFOs and a Bible-believing Christian. Now that he's been investigating, and apparently he's been reading books and things and whatnot, he's now a believer in UFOs and a skeptical Christian. He believes now in the Gnostic Gospels the false gospels that were written during the time of the apostles and a little bit after that that are fake gospels. They're different gospel accounts. And I, I told the man, I said, Sir, with all respect, the Gnostic gospels in many places contradict the four gospels that are in the Bible. I said, therefore, I cannot accept them as truth. And his statement to me was, well, there's books that the early church should have put into the Bible that they never did because it did contradict those four Gospels in there. And I'm going, that's the point. They contradicted the truth of who Jesus was, and, but he didn't believe it. Fiery darts were hurled at his faith. They targeted his faith. Uh, a lady that I worked for, not very long because I kept messing, the, she had a t-shirt kiosk in a mall 
in, in Oklahoma where I was going to Bible college. And I kept messing the t-shirts up so she had to fire me. I'm not a good t-shirt maker. But she was a Baptist Sunday school, Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher for years and then converted to uh, Jehovah's Witness. And she detected me one night trying to witness to her. I started asking her questions, and she said, stop right there. I've been a Baptist Sunday school teacher for 20 years. I've converted to the Jehovah's Witness. You are not going to change my mind with anything you say, so stop right there. Boom. And I'm going... What kind of teacher was she? Satan's darts at her, fire, fiery darts were hurled at her and it caused her to lose her faith in what this book says. And she no longer believes it. She no longer believes that Jesus is God. She no longer believes in hell. She doesn't, there's all kinds of things that she doesn't believe anymore and I don't know how her life ended up because after she fired me, I certainly didn't have anything to do with her after that. But how does that happen? Fiery trial. Doesn't go after your works, people. The devil's already got a hold of your works a long time ago. You blew it a long time ago. He's going after your faith. Guard your faith. Guard your faith. Okay? Because that's where the trial is going to take place. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall try the whole earth. That's what Jesus said. Father, bless your word this morning. We thank you for it. We ask, Father, for your blessings on our faith. Lord, I, I love these people. I want to see them all around the throne of grace one of these days. These people that are with us online, I want to see them all, plus many, many more. Those that listen to us out in Kenya, I want to, I want to see them all around the throne of glory one of these days. But Father, there's as many false teachers and false doctrines and false prophets out in Kenya as there are in America. And I pray, dear God, that you'd bless each and every one. God, that they would never lose their faith nor their trust in your word. Bless us, Father, and bless our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.